a collaboration with the Japan Foundation, and it's the first time they organize collaboration with the institution, which is meant to be promoting the image and the culture of Japan abroad. And so we are delighted to have this uh, first collaboration looking at the transformations in society and politics of uh, Japan after the Second World War. Uh, I'm actually really excited about this exhibition because it's one of the first time that uh, the West, or the world in fact, is looking at Japan in relationship to the Second World War from Japan or from Japanese perspective. So there is a selection of 11 photographers, seminal, super important photographers, uh, looking from within Japan at Japan and the way that Japan has been coping with the trauma of the Second World War, uh, but not insisting on the same tropes and cliches that the West has been using in order to portray the country uh, from elsewhere. So the exhibition is, um, is really like you know, a survey of Japanese photography uh, in the middle of the 20th century, but it is also an exercise on um, self-reflection and self-depiction through the use of camera. The exhibition includes the work of 11 photographers who have been selected by two curators, Mark Fustel and Tsugo Tada. So the exhibition, as I was saying, is divided in three sections. Uh, the first one is the aftermath of war. The second section in Gallery 2 is entitled Between Tradition and Modernity. And then the last section in Gallery 3 is Towards a New Japan. So the exhibition starts here with two images, both by Hiroshi Hamaya. And I think these are very much symbolic and very much representative of the way the exhibition has been constructed. The first image is an image that the photographer took immediately after the announcement of the end of war. And he decided that the most uh, symbolic, almost paradigmatic gesture to do as a photographer would be to go outside and to take a picture of the sun. The picture afterwards, uh, I'll just kind of move slightly in order for you to see it, is instead an image of a newborn baby. And I think in terms of rebirth after the catastrophe and the, and the trauma of the war is another important signal that the country through the eyes of his own photographers was trying to send out to the war. Section two uh, in Gallery Two is titled Between Tradition and Modernity. So it looks at the early to late 50s, nearly up to 1960s, in a time where Japan has a massive economic boom due to special procurement uh, for the Korean conflict. So their economy becomes massive all of a sudden. At the same time, there's a lot of allied influences and Western sort of uh, influences coming into their culture, which is changing their economy, uh, their society, the way they dress, the way they act, pretty much everything. So this room looks at photographers who seek to find what they see as their Japanese roots or holding on to an element of the tradition, as well as capturing the modernity, sneaking into Japanese culture. I'm standing in front of three works by Yasuhiro Ishimoto, who is unique in the exhibition for having studied in America, uh, in Chicago, under Harry Callahan. He spent the war in a Japanese internment camp in America, and then afterwards traveled back to document his hometown. He was actually tasked with a commission uh, to take part in the Family of Man photography exhibition. Uh, organized by Edward Steichen. It's the first work that we approached by him in this gallery is commissioned for the Family of Man exhibition and is taken of Katsua Villa, which was a building of like significant cultural importance for Japan. It had been like a sort of like a palace to us, it's like the equivalent of Buckingham Palace. So he's approaching it in a really American way. It's fascinating to see his work uh, in this exhibition compared to the Japanese photographers. So his works have these really Western aesthetic sensibilities and certainly like this beginning to look at the architectural features, the, the sort of lines and like the modernism and bringing that to a traditional Japanese villa is really fascinating. Whilst in Japan to uh, document the Katsua Villa, 
He's also taking images of the street in Tokyo and the surrounding prefectures. And one image that I'm particularly interested in was, was this work, which shows children just playing in the street, sort of make-believe with these swords as sticks. And something that you notice through certainly the first two rooms of the exhibition is a notable absence of men of a certain age. So there's a number of old men or young boys, but there's this whole generation that's been wiped out due to the war, which left just orphans, like growing up on a street, their, their houses have been devastated, their families are ruined, and they're there sort of growing up together. So I think it's a really poignant and yeah, touching image to be featured in here, especially by Ishimoto's work. Uh, as an aside, anyone with an interest in say anime or manga or Japanese pop culture might recognize this whole sort of orphans growing up on the street like aspect and it's rooted in yeah fact gallery three is uh, upper gallery and its title is towards a new Japan so mainly from the 60s between 60 and 64 which is the point at which our exhibition cuts off it's looking at this period in Japan where there's been this massive economic boom. They've grown more than they'd ever imagined and they're able to sort of assimilate all of these cultural influences and it's really when they're sort of starting again. There's this new generation that's grown up without what I'd imagine is sort of a section of guilt or something like this and they're kind of free from, they're free from the war. So the work on the wall behind me is by Aiko Hoso who is one of the most contemporary photographers that we feature in the exhibition. One work in particular um, from the series Ordeal of Roses or Death by Roses, Badakai, is just stunning that not only the subject matter but the print itself, these kind of ridiculously rich charcoal blacks, it looks like they'll smudge if you touch them. There's so much more contrast as well, print methods and the whole like approach to photography has changed through this exhibition. And you see a young man in his bare torso with a rose covering from sort of heart to throat and he's underneath this carved sort of wing and it's, it's like he's on a tomb or he's like he's on a graveyard. And it's so much more about exploring an identity of a nation now through their unconscious and through sort of how they feel about themselves. And I think it's really indicative of someone that's no longer trying to come to terms with something really visceral and close um, with the war and their defeat being sort of at least two generations, but, um, sorry, two decades behind them now, they can start thinking about how they feel and how they want to express themselves. This model was fascinating. He, um, he had a really illustrious military career. He became like a renowned sword fighter in Japan. He got married, but arguably he's homosexual. Uh, he vehemently denies it, but um, sort of seen in bars in Tokyo. And after this series, I mean, not directly after, but shortly after this series, he storms uh, a um, military base and he barricades himself in the head of the military base's room, he goes out onto the balcony and delivers what he thinks is a really stirring speech about recapturing like, the, the emperor's like, dignity and making Japan powerful again. And all the troops just laugh at him. So he goes back into the office and kills himself. So by Kikuji Kawada, this is part of the map series, uh, the Lucky Strike packet, completely sort of wrinkled and destroyed by me. Kawada's map series features downstairs as well in room one because he documents uh, physical artifacts. He documents um, an atomic bomb site or the will of a kamikaze pilot. So his medium is the real world and he's taken sort of real life objects but it's the way that he works with them that makes him slightly different. It's the way that it's far more textural, like it feels like you could brush across this. And he's using that to kind of communicate a more emotional message than simply a sort of news narrative. It's not photojournalism anymore, it's like feeling something about an image. You can see how it echoes the Japanese flag. You've got this red dot in the middle of a big white ground, but it's made in the USA, proudly stamped at the bottom of it. It's saying a lot about the Western influence. The reason why we decided to bring this exhibition to, to the Open Eye Gallery in Liverpool is because of the history of Open Eye uh, and the way Open Eye has been looking at photography as both a tool of self-emancipation, I think, and self-representation, as well as 
um, a social political strategy. So there's a very strong history and uh, an important legacy with the gallery of the use of photography in, um, in the social realm and the social political realm, in fact. And now I think this exhibition is, is a good exercise in that sense. And also it's kind of bridging history and tradition with contemporaneity because I, I would argue that the way Japan is looking today is a reflection, is an evolution of what it has been established uh, or what it has happened after the Second World War as in many other countries. So it is ultimately a kind of positive representation because although the country had been defeated during the war, actually it's been defeated twice uh, in uh, world wars, uh, Japanese society has been reacting and responding to, to, to trauma quite uh, positively in, 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 in that it has been reconstructing his own identity and transforming his own identity in order to adapt to the new circumstances imposed by the, def uh, the defeat itself. So I think it's a good way to look at history and to look at um, identity and representation in a way in which photography helps on creating uh, forms of emancipation. This is a painting by Henri Matisse, one of the most famous artists again from the 20th century, uh, particularly the first half of the 20th century. Again, what we might call sometimes the golden age of modernism, uh, those great names like Picasso and Matisse. We, we might say actually that Matisse and Picasso are these two in some ways competing rivals, uh, but also have a great respect for each other as well. Later in life, after this painting, a few decades later, they become friends, you know, kind of visiting each other in Paris. Uh, so kind of influencing each other, but also a bit of a rivalry going on as well at the same time. Uh, Matisse, we often say, is the great colorist of the beginning of the 20th century. Whereas Picasso was moving away, I suppose, from traditional rules to do with perspective and depicting space. Uh, whereas Matisse has been quite influenced a little bit by that. He's deliberately eschewed the rules of perspective here. This floor isn't uh, a flat floor going off into the distance. It's been kind of tilted up like that as if it's kind of we're looking straight down at it. And also, but yet everything is kind of resting on the floor. So there is a bit of that Picasso playfulness going on there as well. But also with Matisse, we often think of as a, as a, as a new way of using colour, uh, sometimes a non-naturalistic use of colour, if I can put it that way. Uh, he's been painting like this since 1905. This painting was done in 1919. So he's been painting like this for a, for a number of years and, and throughout the First World War even as well. He's still using these bright colours. Um, uh, him and his friend in 1905, André Durand, they would travel to the south of France. And I think that's where he begins to start really becoming you know, celebratory about colour, those warm, the warm climate at the south of France, the heat, the brightness of the sun, all those beautiful colours. Well, all that comes into the paintings. Uh, and he's still painting like this here in 1919, but this would have been done in Paris, probably a very different environment to that, you know, that kind of, where, where you, if you're in Nice, for example, with the sun and the colours around you. Uh, however, what's going on here is, is a freer use of paint, a freer use of colour. Uh, what we call a fauvist style, if I can blind you with isms again, fauvism. Uh, fauvism really um, was, a, was a criticism, actually. It was a critic who said, oh, you're all fauves. And the word fauve meaning wild beasts. The way you paint, you're like wild beasts. You're like monkeys let loose with a paint box. Uh, a lot of term, terminology in art is, is, is often a criticism. Impressionism was actually a criticism by a critic. You are merely impressionists, or you are fauves, and these names have kind of stuck. Uh, well, of course, it is a wilder use of paint. It's a freer use of paint, and Matisse, of course, was quite, quite happy with a freer use of paint and a freer use of colour. Often he would change the colour of people's faces and people's skin. If I was Matisse and I was painting you and we were in a cold room, I might give you a blue face. Now you haven't really got a blue face, but by giving you a blue face, I can, I can show you, I can show the, I can show the viewer how you're feeling. I can show the, the atmosphere in the room, perhaps all those things. So you might even argue that this use of colour is more realistic. It can show something more real than the photograph. It's um, actually closer to the subject matter than a realistic depiction. 
Uh, this picture, I love the title of this picture because the title is The Inattentive Reader. Uh, the inattentive reader meaning, and I often talk to children about this painting, and I often ask them, I often say, have you ever been in class and your teacher has said to you, oh, read a book, everyone, and you're reading a book, and you're going, yeah, yeah, I'm reading, honestly. Hon honestly, I'm reading, and you're looking out the window, and you're looking everywhere except the book. Well, that's exactly what she's doing here. She's got lots on her mind. Um, she's not really there at all, is she? She's got this kind of pent-up sort of thoughtful face, uh, lots on her mind and looking away from the book. Everybody is looking away from the book. Uh, Matisse isn't particularly interested in the book. It's been painted quite quickly there. Uh, she's not interested in the book. Everybody is contemplating, and the viewer as well isn't interested in the book. Everybody is contemplating this room in their own kind of unique sort of way, I suppose. Uh, so painting like this in a freer way isn't really um, further away from the subject matter. You could argue that Matisse is getting closer to the subject matter. She here, we don't really know who she is, this model, um, although there is a, a sense of intimacy between the male Matisse and this woman in this very female sort of space. If anyone had said to me that this was painted by a woman, I probably would have believed them. It's somehow a very sort of feminine space. So you've got this male painter in this feminine space in a very sort of intimate sort of way. Um, but also I think as well, there's a, there's a word on the label over there which says interiority, interiority. Now that could mean the interior, of course, but also it's about her own interiority, what's going on up here as well. So even though there's something quite playful and free, I think it's quite a sophisticated painting because he's really captured this attitude, this pensive sort of attitude as well. You could also say, you could also say that she's, uh, she's quite casual in her attitude. There's a certain sort of ho-hum, la-la-la sort of attitude as she's leaning there with the book there. Uh, and I think this casual use of paint and her casual attitude come together. So again, the use of paint is actually more about, um, more about her attitude, uh, showing something more than a photograph as well. Now, flowers often appear in paintings, uh, in still life paintings, obviously, and they're often a reminder of death, he says cheerfully there, a reminder of what we call a memento mori, a reminder of our mortality. And even though it's very freely painted, you've got this mirror behind the flowers there, and uh, so the flowers kind of stand out. Uh, and she may also be contemplating this as well, this kind of very contemplative uh, feel to this picture, maybe contemplating life, contemplating mortality or whatever else there as well. The fact that it was done in 1919, which is just after the First World War and done in Paris, there might have been at this point a little brief moment of casual sort of decadent sort of freedom. If you think of the great cities of Europe, um, if you think of Berlin, if you watch Cabaret, for example, if you see Berlin between the wars before the Nazi boot comes along and stamps on everything, again, the same with Paris, we've got this little moment of, of decadent sort of freedom and creativity again before the Nazi boot comes along and stamps on it again. So, uh, I, I mean, maybe I'm overlooking into this picture here in 1919, but I think there's something definitely going on here in 1919. It's a picture that wouldn't have been painted like this uh, later in Europe as well, I don't think so anyway. Um, Matisse, of course, uh, people often say, you know, later on with his cutouts and he becomes more and more abstract as, as, as time goes on. There are huge paintings and collages like the snail, for example. Um, so this interesting colour stays with him for the rest of his life. But a lot of people say that Matisse starts abstract art along with Picasso. But again, you could argue here that Matisse is not an abstract artist. You could say that this freer use of paint, and of course we've talked about Jackson Pollock, the artists become freer and more expressive with paint. They become more and more abstract with paint as the 20th century goes on. So you could say that the roots of abstraction lie in paintings like this. However, I would say that this freer use of paint actually is about her, is about her attitude and this whole sort of decadent, sort of free, casual, relaxed, yet a little bit pensive, sort of worried expression on her face. One of the other things a lot of people say about the beginnings of modern art, at the beginnings of the 20th century, um, is this interest in what we might think of as primitive art. I don't like the word primitive, it, also, it often sounds a bit insulting. We've talked about Picasso looking at African masks and African sculpture. There might be a little bit of that here as well, where Matisse is looking towards something a little bit more untrained in art, uh, African masks, African sculpture, there's a little bit of a feel of that in this face as well. 
Some people have said to me, as I've talked about this painting as well, that there's a kind of Japanese or Chinese influence from, in this woman's face as well. Uh, maybe even in the hair as well. It's interesting that actually, because I think at the end of the 19th century, the borders of Japan were kind of opened in a way. And a lot of Japanese prints and Japanese art make their way into Europe as well. Um, if you look at the paintings of Van Gogh, for example, he was extremely influenced by, by Japanese art and Japanese prints. Sometimes Japanese prints actually feature in some of his paintings. Uh, so as well as this, what we often talk about with Picasso, this interest in African art, African masks, African sculpture, uh, cave drawing, children's art. Remember that famous quote by Picasso? At the age of seven, I could paint like Raphael. It took me a lifetime to learn to how to paint like a child. Well, I think Matisse is doing something similar here. But as well as all that um, African cave drawings, all that kind of stuff, there's something else here which might be a Japanese influence coming into Europe as well. Uh, and also similar to Picasso as well, that interest in children's art, this freedom, this kind of playfulness as well. So a very sophisticated painting in some ways, but a very free and kind of uh, you know, playful sort of fun with the paint as well, I think.